Shabbat Shalom. This morning, we just read Parshat Vayakel, which means, and he gathered. Meaning Moses gathered the Jewish people and taught us about building the Mishkan, the tabernacle. About a lasting institution that created a sense of community and facilitated the worship of a divine being beyond our comprehension. And I believe that we totally take this for granted. For only 23 chapters earlier in the same book of Exodus, we were slaves. Only months earlier, we were whipped and beaten by taskmasters, and now we're tasked with building one of the most revolutionary and iconic religious institutions the world would ever know. And we just assume that the Jewish people gathered before Moses there in the desert were up to the challenge. We take it for granted that there will be a functioning Mishkan in just a couple of weeks. We take it for granted that they will carry it in the desert for 40 years and that their children will eventually bring it into our ancestral promised land, then bring it up to Jerusalem and eventually transfer the entire process into the Holy Temple on the Temple Mount. And the reason why we take this generation for granted, the reason why we take their transition from a slave mentality to a free functioning people for granted, the reason why we take all of their achievement for granted, perhaps, is because we've read the ending. We know it all works out for them. We read it every year. We are obsessed with the story of this desert generation. We live with this generation week in and week out for almost the entire year, each and every year. And we've become, unfortunately, desensitized to the improbability of it all working out. Simply put, we rarely put ourselves in their shoes and feel their sense of trepidation and anxiety and concern that they must have felt in those lonesome desert years. And the reason I bring this idea up this week is because it was my grandfather's yurt site on Wednesday. And my family gathered this week to remember Simon Ba Leibovitz. We called him Ba. And he, like all of my grandparents, were part of a generation of Jews who experienced a transition from slavery to freedom, who prevailed over Nazism and European anti-Semitism, and went on to achieve extraordinary accomplishments that today we all take for granted. And I'm pretty sure it's because we know the ending. But how could one possibly assume that prevailers of the Shoah, like my grandfathers, after seeing the horrors of war and totalitarianism, anti-Semitism, and the murder of much of their families, would meet and marry my grandmothers, who had both been inmates of Auschwitz and lived through the lowest depravity of humankind, a total moral eclipse for years. How could anybody assume that those couples would actually want to stand once again under Talitot and marry using the ancient Jewish formula of consecrating ourselves in marriage before God? How could anybody assume that they would want to bring children into a world after all that they had witnessed? How could anybody imagine that they move from the ashes of an ethical void like Europe to the more hopeful yet unwelcoming America in 1946, which had little to no desire to welcome Jewish immigrants. Why would they or anybody figure on the type of overwhelming success they and the members of their generation from those shtetls experienced here 
in this country and in building a modern state of Israel over the course of their lifetimes. As I continue to read and study the works of the great thinkers of modernity regarding religion, of Freud and Durkheim and James and the likes, they cause me to stop and reflect on this issue. Is the reason why we have trouble reflecting because we simply have trouble empathizing as humans? It could be part of it. Is it because we're jaded, because we know how their lives turned out in the end? Perhaps. But I fear that it's hard to reflect on their life journeys because it leads us to putting our own lives in comparison, to juxtaposing our lives with theirs. It leads us to minimizing the impact of our lives. To think for one moment that my life journey from childhood to adulthood, from Chicago to LA, from filmmaking to the rabbinate, can in any way be compared to the journey of my grandfather, Ba, from the little village in the Carpathian Mountains where he grew up and married and had a child, to Russia to fight with the Russian army against the Nazis, to the knowledge that his first family had been murdered, to Budapest where he met and married my grandmother, Gami, to a flight in 1946 from Budapest to Paris to Newfoundland to Chicago to a new world with new children with new possibility, to compare those two journeys is to come to the stark realization concerning the privileged, protected, postmodern life that I have lived. It is to realize the profound impact his life had in the narrative of the Jewish people and humanity at large, and it prompts me to question the purpose of my own. Few of us participate in such generational paradigm shifts. Few of us live through such times when the future existence of Judaism actually appears totally uncertain. And if we're totally honest, completely honest with ourselves, few of us want to live during those times. None of us would want to face the choices my grandparents faced or meet the challenges that were forced upon them and their families. And therein lies the key, the comfortable distance. That's the reason why the desert generation of the Torah fascinates us to no end, at a comfortable distance. That's the reason why we must tell their story over and over again. And that's the reason why the survivor, prevailer generation fascinates us as well. And we must feel compelled to tell their stories again and again, but we do it from a comfortable distance. I grew up with very little distance between me and the stories of the Shoah. Even as a child, I recognized that there was tremendous strength in Ba a message in his life, an inspiring spirit that lacks in my own. I knew it even as a child standing next to him. To stand next to Ba was to stand next to a giant. To hold his hand was to touch the hand of the Jews that were freed from slavery, that received the Torah, that built the Mishkan, and charted the course for all Jewish generations to follow. When we were children, my brother and sister and I, we would sit by his side at the Passover table. And he would lead a Seder about the desert generation after Egypt. And I'm sure it prompted him to reflect on his own brothers and sisters who didn't make it out of Europe, about his previous family, about the life that he knew before. And it never dawned on me as a child that the story we were reading was his story. At the Seder, Ba would drink a tall glass of Slivovitz, and he'd share it with us, and he'd smile when we choked on it as children. 
And I believe now that that Slivovitz that tasted like a memory from long before. We always had Slivovitz at Rosh Hashanah, at Yom Kippur, at Passover. And now it makes me happy that we serve it here almost every Shabbat at Adat Shalom. The only thing Ba had left from a time before were the ancient traditions of the Haggadah and the taste of that drink. And we had him. We had Ba. We had a reminder that we are a family, a people, a nation that overcomes our adversaries, prevails over our enemies, rises through education and intellectuality and business to new heights. We are a people that walks into desert and sees the possibility of bloom. We are a people who recognizes the spark of the everlasting God in the spark of one another. And I recognize that not every family has a Ba. And there are, unfortunately, less and less prevailers alive to meet and to celebrate. I recognize that the comfortable distance is a problem. And that's why I'm proud to announce that here at Adat Shalom, we'll be partnering with Cafe Europa, a social club for survivors living in Los Angeles run through the Jewish Family Services, to hold a program here on Wednesday, May 8th. Here in our sanctuary, we will have a performance by Violins of Hope, just featured in the LA Times, playing a, a violin destroyed during the Shoah and refurbished in Tel Aviv. And then we will all have dinner together. Our Adat Shalom community and the Cafe Europa community as well. Our entire community is invited to the evening. It is not only our privilege to welcome prevailers of the Shoah, it is, simply put, our obligation to know them and to laugh with them and to cry with them while they're still alive. In the history of the Jewish people, not every generation is a transformational one, which builds lasting institutions and recharts our future. Some of us simply safeguard and protect Jewish life and help it blossom and help hand it to the next generation without very much impediment at all. And it is our responsibility to remember those generations who overcome extraordinary challenge, who forge our new identity. In the Torah this week, Moses gathers us and unfortunately we're called Adat B'nai Yisrael, the congregation of the children of Israel. And we don't know the individual names of who was standing there. We've lost the record of all of those names. And that's why it seems so important that we don't lose the individual names and stories of each prevailer whose life hung in the balance, whose future was indeed uncertain, whose accomplishments we should never take for granted. I haven't had the privilege of standing next to Ba for 26 years now. And I can still feel Ba's wet kisses like it was yesterday. I stand here as but one of his accomplishments. My parents stand here as two more. My children, my nieces, my nephews, my sister, my brother is more. But in reality, all of us who stand here, who gather here each and every Shabbat, we learn his lessons here in the sanctuary. We pledge to continue this beautiful tradition. We promise to tell and retell these amazing stories about our family and God, and we stand as even more. May we never take their lives for granted. May we never forget their stories. May we never lose their taste for courage and perseverance and freedom and love and Yiddishkeit, even when it tastes like Slivovitz. May the memory of Simon Baal Leibovitz, Shimon Zelig ben Avraham Vilea, forever be a blessing to all those who loved him, 
and the entire Jewish people. And let us all say, Amen. Amen. Amen.